Hello and welcome to another lecture in sound design where here we will be talking about spatial audio in the web audio API. Now spatial panning is probably the most complicated built-in operation in the web audio API. It certainly involves the audio node with the most parameters of which some of the, the meaning of some of those parameters are quite complex. And you need to work not just with one node, but also with an object of the audio context, a property of the context, the audio listener. So let's begin. The spatial panning, the way it works, it's similar to how panning is done in uh, graphics and audio game software for uh, visual rendering as well as audio rendering. So it is not an unusual paradigm when one wants to represent the geometry of a situation. Here, one has a listener, just one listener, with a head orientation, the head can be positioned in any way and um, a forward pointing direction. So keep in mind, there's a forward pointing direction and the um, orientation of the head and that listener's location. Only one listener though. So no matter where the sources are, there's only one listener perceiving them. However, you could envisage situations where each different listener has, um, well, each person perceiving the content has their own audio context with their own audio listener for that audio context. So there's this listener in the space, and then sources can be positioned spatially using panel nodes, where each panel node takes one input channel and produces stereo output that has been. Uh, spatially positioned. So the position is given by, um, to, uh, sorry, the, the source, the sound that emits that is received by the listener is determined by the location of the source, its main orientation, so how, say, my voice is projected, and then a cone describing how diffuse it is away from there, and um, the distance model describing how it moves over time. And then there's how it should be um, received in terms of the rendering model or the panning model. So standard stereo layout or something more fancy. So we're going to um, talk in detail both about the panel node and the audio listener. The panel node, despite this complexity, in many ways it's like the other nodes. It can be called in two different uh, techniques, either um, by creating a new panel node where one can set some of the options at the point of creation, or as a method of the context, the create panel method. Okay, so in order to understand this whole spatial system, it's really, right com it's really very confusing if you haven't dealt with it a lot before. But keep in mind the axes and their orientation in this sort of space. And it's always determined by what's known as the right hand rule. So take your right hand, by the way, the, some uh, software uh, development environments, some IDEs, they use left-hand rule. So you do need to know how your system is working. But more commonly used is the right-hand rule. And it starts like this. Take your right hand, put it in front of you, so that most of your fingers are pointing towards you. Your index finger pointing up, your thumb pointing to the side, to the right as you're looking at it. Then you can go around X, Y, Z axes. So if, if I leave it as is, the Y axis is pointing up. That's the vertical. The X axis is your horizontal axis. 
And on the horizontal plane, there's a depth as well, back and forth, that's the z-axis. You can turn these around, you can represent it uh, different ways, but this relationship of x, y, and z is always this way. And we set it up so that y is always vertical, x is the main horizontal, z is the depth, also on the horizontal plane. So in this coordinate system, 1, 0, 0 is on the positive x-axis. 0, 1, 0, that's height, that's higher on the positive y-axis. And 0, 0, 1, in most positions that will be towards you. So that's kind of what another thing to keep in mind. Where is the positive z-axis? That's where your fingers are pointing when you set your right hand up this way. Um, and so the positive z-axis, as I'm looking at it, it's going out of the computer towards me. Okay, so let's talk about the audio listener for a second. First, from 0, 0, 0, wherever we set the, uh, the center of our coordinate system, there is a position vector specifying where this listener is. There is an up vector specifying the direction that the listener's head, the top of the listener's head, is pointing up towards, so from their feet to the top of the head, where it's pointing up. If that can be um, rotated around. And then there is the front pointing direction. Now, this up and front direction are always mutually perpendicular, but the up direction still needs to be specified because the head could be turned on its side. The front direction is where you're looking, what's straight ahead of you. So position, up, and forward directions determine everything we need to know about the audio listener. Each of them have x, y, and z coordinates because we're in a 3D world. Web Audio API decided to specify these as position X, position Y, position Z, rather than um, just a matrix with three elements, which is a little bit awkward, means that in most situations, it's written a bit longer than needs to be. Anyway, position, it defaults to the center of the coordinate system. Up means pointing vertical. And the forward direction, given our right hand rule, it's pointed away. So that sort of makes sense. It's a negative value, so not towards where I am personally right now, but away from me. So it's sort of, it's the way, if I stand, I am in the right position for it to be the listener. Although it's called an audio listener, as a method of the context or property of the context, it's just listener. So you just set my listener to context.listener. I suppose you could even work just with context.listener directly, and you can set its values like position x this way. Then we have the panner node. So the panner node does not have position forward x and up x because there's no top of the listener's head. It's a sound source. But it does have its position and it has its orientation, which direction is the source going. Both of them, again, 3D coordinates. Default position is also at the center of the coordinate system, just like the listener. The orientation defaults to, to the right on the horizontal plane. Then we have a cone, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it's actually sort of an area between a small cone and a large cone. So we define an inner and an outer angle. And we define what's known as the cone outer gain. Again, we'll talk about that. And then there are some uh, parameters related to the distance between a source and listener and how, or, or really regardless of where the listener is, how the sound emitted from that source 
it gets attenuated um, as it travels over distance. And to do that, we need a distance model, a reference distance. Below that distance, it doesn't really change. A roll-off factor, determining how quickly it changes as it propagates away. And a maximum distance, beyond which it doesn't change again. Um, and how those parameters are used are dependent on the distance model. Finally, we have a panning model so that the sound, once we've determined how the sound is processed, we then need to actually render it over speakers or over headphones using a, a certain rendering system. And it could be something just like the stereo panning that we've talked about before, or something far more advanced that takes into account how the sound should bounce off your body, your head, uh, your ears, as it reaches you, if that sound was really coming at you in the real world, rather than, say, listening over headphones. Okay, so can, let's try to come to grips with things, how it's working here. We have the panner node. Here it is. I've offset it from the center just so you can see differences, but it has an orientation on the x-axis. And so that's a sound. Uh, it's as if I was projecting my voice this way. And then we have our audio listener. Now, um, pointing up, looking forward, so that's actually away from the source, looking the other direction, negative z-axis, so far out into space, um, and we have its position as well. Okay, so at this point, I think we fully understand most of the audio listener, so let's just focus on the panner node. The panner has its position, it has its direction, vector, do we call that direction? Orientation. Um, but it gives the direction it's, it's pointing, so the orientation. And we have this cone around it. So essentially outside the cone, the um, source amplitude is severely attenuated. If a source is highly, highly directional, then it may only be heard in a small area and it's virtually gone away from that area. Um, so you have that cone and you also often define a inner cone where the sound isn't really attenuating at all within, within some area, but between the inner and outer cone, it slowly degrades from its highest amplitude or least attenuation to most attenuation. So this is describing the directivity of a sound source, how diffuse it is as the sound propagates from the source out into space around. So a bit more about the sound cones. Here's how it looks. So here you have the output of a panel node. And in our 3D space, we define, so rather than the circle shown here, it's a ball or a sphere around that um, that source going into the panel node. But we define an outer angle and an inner angle. When the listener is in this green area, so um, the angle between the listener and the panel, based on the panel's orientation, you have a listener here, you have an orientation there. Um, when that angle is less than the inner angle, so it could be anywhere in this whole space, then the um, intensity remains constant for the angle. Typically some small number, but um, not really changing. And, ah, yeah, typically, you, sorry, typically you set it to one. So it only then starts to drop off. This gain here defaults to one, but then when you're between the inner angle and some outer angle, it drops off from one, going down to, depending on the model, a cone outer gain. Some of the models that we look at 
by the way, will have no cone out again. So it just continually drops as it goes to a larger and larger angle. What happens if it's out here? We treat that actually as the same angle. We're just concerned with this absolute value. So for instance, if it's somewhere right here, that's very close to a zero. But now the listener might be looking in the wrong direction. That will affect things. It might be further away from the source. That might be affecting things. The source might still be oriented that way. So though the angle is small, the intensity could still drop off quite a lot. And yeah, sources can be omnidirectional. You can specify this inner angle to be 360 degrees so that it's gain of one in all directions. The angle doesn't matter. The sound emits equally in all directions. Okay, so that's how it depends on the angle. How does it depend on the distance? Because if I'm speaking at you and you're behind me, it sounds quieter, but obviously it also sounds quieter if I'm half a mile away from you. So we need to get that effect. So we have three different distance models that can be used. Linear, inverse, which is our default and is a fairly natural behavior and one that best models the real world, and exponential. Um, the, all of them have a reference distance which means that when a source is very close to the listener, then the source can move around a little bit, but we're keeping the gain fixed at one. We're essentially saying the sound is not rolling off with distance until it gets to a certain point. That does actually make sense. Um, the way your hearing works, it compresses sounds. Um, and you don't tend to notice anyway a big drop off until you're over a certain distance. Plus, if a source is right on top of a listener, then the inverse uh, square law with distance gets very problematic because essentially you're dividing by zero. So we just set gain equal to one over these short distances. So in the first case, linear, gain is one, then from some reference distance already mentioned to some maximum distance, the gain just linearly drops off from one to the other. Until once we get to the maximum distance, then we have our gain equals um, one minus roll off times and at the maximum distance it's just uh, d max minus d ref or maximum distance minus reference distance over the same thing maximum minus reference so the gain is just one minus roll off so it drops off from some set value linearly to some final value at the maximum distance if i use the inverse gain then it drops off with some inverse linear relationship so it ends up going like this um, and it continues going, never fully reaches zero. We don't use the maximum distance. And if it's exponential, then the gain also drops off with distance. But now our roll-off can define some exponential rate and make it a very extreme roll-off or a very, very mild roll-off, whatever we want it to be. Okay, so what's happening? We specify a listener specify a source location, we specify how that um, sound gets attenuated with the angle involved, we specify how it gets attenuated with the distance. One more thing is now that we have a lot of information, how do we actually render it? Well, we have what we call the equal power model. And I should note the definition is slightly problematic because actually the way it's mathematically defined, it's close to but not exactly equal power. And we talked about that when we discussed the stereo panning. But essentially this is the same as stereo panning. So it only takes angles on the horizontal plane into account. 
if it's minus 90 degrees, so if the source is out here and you're listening over there, that's like panning to minus one, completely to the left. If the source is directly in front of you, that's like panning of zero. And if the source is far to the right of you, that's like panning of plus one in stereo panning and that's a 90 degree angle. So you're interested in this azimuth angle, which is the angle of a source around you on the horizontal plane. But it ends up being a fairly simple and efficient algorithm, just like stereo panning. But of course, now it takes into account uh, things like distance and this um, sound cone behavior. So it's like enhancing the stereo panning to deal with actual locations and directivity on the horizontal plane. But if we really want something that sounds great on headphones, that is very realistic, then we go with the HRTF panning model. HRTF stands for Head Related Transfer Functions. I've given whole three hour lectures on HRTFs and people have gotten PhDs on them. But the basic idea is that when sound reaches you, it gets processed by the sound traveling through your body, being reflected off of the body, being attenuated. So there's some reflections due to your torso, there's some due to the shape of the head, some of the traveling, sound traveling around your head, some of it being attenuated. This is all frequency dependent. And then the sound gets attenuated, filtered, by your ear and reflected off of your ear, the whole shape of the ear, the um, outer ear as well, it all affects that sound. And this is not even counting the processing that's done uh, in the middle ear and inner ear, but we don't need to model any of that. So if we essentially um, take a lot of people and measure the sound right at the point it reaches your outer ear. So after most of these reflections off of what's called the pinna, um, we can find out how a sound emitted from a source at a given angle gets processed when it meets both ears. And we can then, for a sound located anywhere in a virtual space, apply that same processing and get the sound to sound very realistic. That's what the HRTF model does. It stores a lot of measured responses from people for sounds at given positions, given angles in space. We don't usually measure distances, although we do know that with large distances, it obeys nice behavior, but it, there's still some factors. But mainly we can tell with different angles and that information is stored and if one uses the HRTF model, it's applied. Okay, so let's put this all together. How does it work? The um, panel node, first it finds the distance between the source and the listener. And we apply again based on that distance model. Then we find the angle between the source and the listener. So the listener is listening for sounds over here. The source is coming that way. There's going to be some angle in between those two directions. That, that's what gets calculated. And then we apply the gain based on um, the angle we found and the cone inner angle, outer angle, outer gain to see how the gain gets modified or how a new gain gets applied based on the sound cone. And now we find the azimuth and elevation angles between the listener and the forward direction. And we apply gain based on a panning model. Luckily, you don't have to do any of this. That's all that's what goes on under the knee, under the hood in the panner node you just need to set the user adjustable parameters or sometimes leave some of them at default value. So let's, we're going to work through an example. We're going to start off with a source at zero, zero, minus one. So we're not using the vertical. 
the source is placed away from me, I'm at I'm the listener, I'm at zero zero zero. So we um we just set the listener all to defaults. Listeners looking straight a straight ahead, the source out here, and we're going to have the source oriented towards the listener. So straight on sound cone. Um, we specify a cone in an angle of 45 degrees. So that's actually 22.5 either side of the straight ahead forward direction. And a cone outer angle of 90 degrees or 45 degrees either side. <coughs> where we have some transition from inner to outer there. And we are also going to specify a reference distance, which means if we move this source closer, then gain stays at one in this whole region. Okay, let's try this out. So you should be seeing, just checking, good, it is recording. You should be seeing the, um, panning HTML file right here. Just a few lines. We have two sliders, one for movement on the X axis and one for movement on our Z axis. So on screen, it's going to look left, right and up, down. But what we're representing is position on a on a horizontal plane. And then we need to change some parameters away from their default. Now, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I, some of these are already at their defaults. But for clarity, I went ahead and showed them anyway. We set the position of our panner node. So of some source that's being panned, we set the orientation. And these are the same positions and orientations that correspond with the figure I just showed in the slides. Set the parameters of the sound cone, 45 degrees and 90 degrees, and the outer gain drops to one tenth. So it's still audible outside the sound code, just heavily attenuated. The reference distance 0 0.5 as before. And we specify a listener. Now here, I didn't even need to specify the listener because I'm just using the default listener and I'm not changing any of its parameters. But if I wanted to change any of its parameters, I could then specify listener.position.value and so, so forth. If you run into any problems, do look at the um, help on the web audio API. All of these aspects are explained. So when I adjust one of the two sliders, I change the panning position and it, the sound should change based on everything that's been shown. Okay, let's give it a go. I think you should hear sound right from the beginning. Okay, you should have heard that. And um, as I move the source X direction or Z direction, Z direction, it's changing in amplitude. And if you listen over headphones, you'll really be hearing differences between the left and right channels. You might have heard a bit of a sort of pop type sound as the source gets very close to you and then away. And that's because we change the way it's transitioning and then it suddenly stays at a high gain and then transitions back down. But you can certainly tweak the parameters and tweak the choice of models so that it sounds very clean. It's actually a very, very powerful tool, the Pano node. And, um, and hopefully it gives you a real sense of a hot topic, which is spatialization of audio. 
So that's it for this lecture. As always, if you have questions, please get in touch. And thank you very much.